But at any rate, uh, let's go to John 19. I'll be reading in the New Living Translation. John 19, then we do 20, 21, we're done. And is that about the time you and I will be going to uh, Hawaii on a cruise? And I just want to tell you, I love you so much that while Debbie and I are gone on that cruise, I won't be thinking about the church at all. <laughs> and I told her, if I go to the beach, don't be taking any pictures of me running on the beach because I don't look like Tom Selleck. <laughs> don't be doing that. At any rate. So in the 19th chapter, then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put a purple robe on him. Hail, King of the Jews, they mocked as they slapped him across the face. Now, if Jesus was innocent, uh, he should have been turned loose. If he was guilty of the charge, uh, then he should have been crucified. But to scourge him, to beat him uh, before he'd been pronounced guilty was against their own law. Pilate did it because he thought it would please the Jews. And uh, I said this last week, I'm going to say it again. For those people that are anti Semites, let me go ahead and tell you this. Uh, uh, Jesus was not killed by Jews. He was killed by you and I. Because he died for all of our sin. Amen. So all that bigotry, you can leave it behind. God's a God of love. Amen. Amen. So the ch soldiers took this honor, opportunity to have their fun with him before he was crucified. And when it says they smote him with their hands, it means they played a cruel Roman game. The game was this. While they were marching somebody to crucify him, uh, they would put a blindfold on him and they would beat him. And as they're beating him, then they take the, the blindfold off and ask him, who is it that hit you? And then they put the blindfold. So by the time they got ready to crucify him, uh, he was almost dead. The Lord was so mutilated that you couldn't have recognized him. Isaiah 52, 14 says it like this. As many were astonished at the, uh, his visage or his appearance was so marred more than any man and his for form more than the sons of men. In other words, you couldn't recognize Jesus as a man because of how severely he was built. I remember one time when I preached on this, a guy said, you don't have to be so graphic about it. No, I think we need to be graphic about it. He suffered greatly, and he suffered for my sin and your sin. Amen. So Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I'm going to bring him out to you, but, now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe, and Pilate said, look, here is the man. The, the weird thing about saying here is the man is Pilate didn't get it. This was not just a man. This was the Son of God. This is the, the Bible said all things were made by him and for him. The Bible says everything is held together by the word of his power. This is God standing before them. Amen. But here's Pilate saying, here's the man. When they saw him, the leading priests and temple guards began shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! And, and Pilate says, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find him not guilty. It was probably, most scholars believe it's about this time, that Pilate really grabbed the basin of water and washed his hands to say, I'm done with it. The water may have cleaned his hands, but it couldn't clean his heart from the guilt that he had. Amen? In fact, one of the oldest creeds of the Christian church actually state that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. The seventh verse says the Jewish leaders replied, By our law he ought to die because he called himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more frightened than ever. He took Jesus back into the headquarters again and asked him, Where, where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Why don't you talk to me, Pilate demanded. Don't you realize that I have the power to release you or crucify you? And I love this statement. Then Jesus said, you'd have no power over me at all unless it's given to you from the above. So the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. What's he saying? Same thing he said before. To understand this, nobody takes my life, but I lay it down. 
I want you to see that Jesus is in control of this whole thing. People want to act like, they want to act like, well, you know, uh, uh, Jesus was on trial. Jesus was never on trial. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He knew where he was. He kept his dignity through this whole thing. He wasn't on trial. Pilate was on trial. The others that were consenting to his death, they were on trial. Amen? Then Pilate tried to release him, but the Jewish leader shouted, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who declares himself a king is a rebel against Caesar. And from that time, Pilate sought to release him because, why? Because he believed in him? No. Because he knew the Lord Jesus was an innocent man. He'd already said that. Jesus is now in the hands of a cheap politician, not the judge of Roman justice who's supposed to be. Anybody get tired of cheap politicians? I'm sick of it. Amen? I remember when I first got saved and called to ministry, and uh, back, back when I had a whole lot more hair, and, uh, and I remember that this guy told me, he said, man, he said, you need to start wearing a suit if you're going to be a preacher. And, and I said, what's wrong with these leathers I'm wearing? He said, now let me ask you this. Who are you going to trust more, somebody walking up to a suit or somebody wearing leathers? I said, somebody wearing leathers. Well, why is that? Because everybody who's ever a suit was there to arrest me or take my money. <laughs> so that's why I don't trust them. But anyway, uh, the, the, the point is, is that Pilate let the role that he was playing become greater to him than what his conscience was. He was the chief politician. But he wasn't delivering any kind of justice because he already knew that Jesus was innocent. It's a terrible thing even today when government, whether it be the church or state government, gets into the hands of men who are hungry for power and they don't regard either God or man. Pilate had tried many things to get Jesus relieved, but, but this was a tough argument now because now they're, gonna, they're telling him, you're an enemy of Caesar. When they said this, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again. Then Pilate sat down on the judgment seat on the platform that is called the stone pavement in Hebrew, Gabbatha, which actually there was something that they, where if they had to make judgment, they would bring this piece of stone pavement with them. Did you know that? So wherever he sat was a place of judgment. But anyway, it was now about noon on the day of preparation for the Passover, and Pilate said to the people, Look, here is your king. And Jews reckoned uh, time. Uh, somebody, uh, anybody ever told you, listen, I don't understand. One gospel gives one time. Another gospel gives another time. What in the world is the difference? I, I can't believe in a Bible where it, ha it contradicts each other. And I've been hearing that for years. Normally what I'll do when somebody said, I can't believe in that Bible, it contradicts you. I usually throw the Bible to them and say, show me. But I want to explain this to time. Jews always thought of time or reckoned timed uh, to begin from sunrise. That would make this uh, the sixth hour uh, approximately noon by Jewish reckoning. Mark said that Jesus was crucified at 9 a.m. And Matthew and Mark and Luke all clearly stated there was darkness from noon until 3 p.m. when Jesus died. So John wasn't using Jewish time. John was using the Ro Roman method of counting time. And that would mean Jesus was condemned by Pilate here at about 6 a.m. in the morning. Away with him, they yelled. Away with him. Crucify him. What? Crucify your king, Pilate said. We have no king but Caesar. The leading priest shouted back. As I said earlier, Jesus never lost his dignity. He never lost his identity. Pilate is forced into a choice here. Will it be Jesus Christ or Caesar? The religious leaders are forced to a choice. Will it be Jesus Christ or Caesar? And they make their dreadful choice. They say, we have no king but Caesar. But I remember what Jesus said. He said, he that isn't for me is against me. 
Now, some people will judge Pilate for this decision, but I just want to remind you of something. That every time the gospel is preached, a decision is made, either for or against. I've actually had people that will hear the gospel message about Jesus dying for their sins, paying the penalty for our sins, and all that you have to do is receive him as Lord and Savior, and they'll walk out of here and they'll tell me, one of these days I'm going to make that decision, and they're upset when I say, you already did. Because he said, if you're not for me, you're against me. There are choices made every day in a believer's life, even after they've come to Christ. They choose whether to do things God's way or do it their own way. They choose to do it God's way or they're led by peer pressure. Many times the choices people make, they make those choices based upon what they want, not what God wants. Does this make sense? Every time there's a little bit of squabble inside of our church, I'll have people inside the church taking sides. And it really ticks me off. So I handle it with love and I tell them, that's why we got 30 acres out here so we can bury you troublemakers. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. But the reality of it is, is that we are left with decisions all the time. Do I do what God wants me to do, or I do what my flesh wants me to do, or what somebody else wants me to do. You have to come to those decisions all the time. And I have chosen that day to day, minute by minute, when it comes to time to make a choice, I'm going to choose God's way. Amen. Yet I hear of Christians that, that say, no, I love the Lord. Now, I'm not perfect, and then they tell me about some sin that they're involved with. As if I'm supposed to say, oh, well, nobody's perfect, don't worry about it. Let me tell you something, if you're a Christian, act like one. Walk in holiness. The most natural thing for a Christian to do is live a holy life. Because the Spirit of God is leading us and guiding us to walk in holiness. Amen? And yet I see Christians fighting with each other and pointing their fingers at each other and accusing each other, and I have something to share with you. There is one called the accuser of the brethren in Romans 12, I think 10. The accuser of the brethren is Satan. So every time you decide rather to love and, and uh, uh, rather than love, you're going to accuse somebody, you're really changing sides. Because God desires us to love one another. And when we decide we're going to take sides, you've taken part with the accuser of the brethren. Say this. Say, Pastor, I feel a little rebuked. Well, good. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> In the 16th verse, then Pilate turned Jesus over the, to them to be crucified. From the standpoint of the Lord Jesus, from his standpoint, it's a sacrifice. And he knows that he's going to have to give this sacrifice uh, uh, of his body. As a matter of fact, in the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews, he has a conversation with God the Father, and he says, Sacri uh, sacrifice and offerings, were, they weren't pleasing to you. But you have given me this body that I can offer. Do you, can you find that scripture? I know it's somewhere in the Bible. <laughs> it's in the 10th chapter of the Hebrews, or my name isn't Harold McGillicuddy. <laughs> Did you find it? Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice, this is, this is Jesus' conversation with the Father God. Sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. So Jesus came out of the heavenlies. God had prepared him a body, Jesus Christ. A body. A human body 
born of the Virgin Mary. And he says, uh, then I said, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I've come in the volume of the book it's written of me to do your will, O God. So Jesus went willingly and the body that the Father had presented him to offer it as a sacrifice for your sin and my sin. We make salvation way too difficult. Not difficult at all. If you came into this place today and you'd say, listen, I know that if I died today that I wouldn't spend an eternity with God, then you have no excuse to walk out of here without accepting Jesus. Jesus has already done his part. He offered his body as a sacrifice for your sin. He already paid for your sin. All you got to do is say yes to him. Hallelujah. So as far as Jesus was concerned... Uh, his body was a sacrifice. He's the Savior. He makes himself an offering for sin. He is a sweet-smelling savor to God. It's an act of obedience on his part. Paul tells us in Philippians 2.8 that he became obedient to death, even the death, death of the cross. From the standpoint of you and I, believers in Christ Jesus, it was a substitution. He took my place. He took your place. We were sinners. He was not. But the sin, your sin and my sin, was laid upon him, and we received his righteousness. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? He was the sinless one suffering for the sinner. He was the just one suffering for the unjust. It says in 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, say, I'm dead to sin. Amen. We, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Now, from the standpoint of Satan, it was a triumph and also a defeat. It was a triumph for Satan to bruise the heel of the woman's seed, as foretold in Genesis 3. It was a defeat because the head of Satan is yet to be crushed that through the death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, Hebrews 2.14. Now from the standpoint of the world, the cross is nothing but a brutal murder. They see Jesus of Nazareth. They see the man. They see the injustice. They led him away to be crucified. Psalm 94, 20 and 21 says, Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee? which frameth mischief by law, they gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. Talking about Jesus. So they took Jesus away. In the 17th verse, carrying the cross by himself, he went to the place called the place of the school in Hebrew, Golgotha. Golgotha literally means the school from Strong's Concordance. Now Luke used a different word. He used the word cranion, which we get the word cranium from. And it, uh, uh, it's translated Calvary to identify this place in Luke 23. The exact location of Golgotha, you know, I've been, I, I, I've, uh, been to Israel, and I, the, the exact place of Golgotha, they've been arguing about it for years. Can I tell you something? I really don't care. I don't care if they, if they can identify the exact place where Golgotha was. You know why? All I really care about is my Jesus took all my sin there. In the 18th verse there, they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side with Jesus between them. It was the, it was the worst type of torture you could ever go through to be hung on a cross. Roman crucifixion began with a whipping of the condemned. The whip that was used had several strips of leather that Jagged pieces of metal and glass or bone tied to the ends so it wouldn't just hurt, but it actually tore open the skin and opened the flesh. Jesus received 39 of these stripes during his trial before Pilate. The condemned was then led through the town to the place of crucifixion, carrying his own cross. Somebody that watched the Passion of Christ uh, would go like this and say, I don't think they should have made it so brutal. It wasn't even close. Because when you got done watching the Passion of Christ, you could still identify 
him as a man. But Isaiah says he couldn't be identified because his body had been torn so much he no longer appeared as a man. Then after they're led to the cross, the feet were placed one on top of the other with the knees in a bent position and a single spike driven through them into the footrest on the cross and that so he could have partial support. But why? The arms were outstretched and in the wrist they would drive nail, spikes into that. But why did the knees have to be bent? So periodically they could force themselves up to be able to get a breath because usually what they died of was suffocation. They couldn't breathe as they were slumped on that cross. So periodically with the spike right in their feet, they'd have to push themselves to try to get a breath. And the longest recorded one that died upon the cross was hanging on that cross for nine days before he died. I'm so thankful my Lord didn't have to endure that for nine days. The pain was unbearable. When they first nailed him on that cross, then they would lift up the cross and let it drop into the hole. When it dropped into the hole, it would tear the flesh and the feet and the arms even more. And then they started trying to, to just survive. Pain was unbearable. Trying to breathe, unbearable. And Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So many people would read it. And I've had people say, well, I don't understand why they wrote it in three languages. Well... It was written in Hebrew because that was the language of religion. It was written in Greek because that was the language of culture and education. It was written in Latin because that was the language of law and order. So it was written in such a way that anybody passing by of any, of any uh, persuasion at all could read what it was being said there. So the whole world could see that he died for all of us. Now, before I go on, I, I, I'm going to go on here, but I, I just got to tell you, I'm blown away by this. I'm blown away that anybody can read about the crucifixion, and after reading about the crucifixion, I'm blown away that they can be complacent about their walk with God. After all that Jesus endured so that you and I might have eternal life, should there be any question about whether or not we're going to live for Him? Come on, church. All the time you have people that say, you know, I'm doing the best I can. They're very complacent about their walk with God. I'm not going to be complacent about it. He's not part of my life. He is my life. And every now and then I'll have people say, listen, we've got a lot of stuff going on in the church, but I have my own life. No, you don't have your own life. The Bible says very clearly we were bought with a price, and we are not our own. That's why I joke about it sometimes with people, but they'll say, man, it seems like there's always something going on. Yes, all we want is all your time and all your money. Is that too much to ask? Because I know, and Debbie and I have known this for years, we know that our life is not our own. I was joking about going on a cruise and not thinking about the church, but she's lived with me the whole time I've been in ministry. There isn't a time that I'm not thinking about you guys. I love you. I care about what happens inside of your life. When you're in anguish, I'm in anguish. When you're hurting, I'm hurting. Does, does this make sense? Did you know why it has to be that way? Because I am an under-shepherd to the great shepherd, Jesus. And if I don't have his heart, then I can't be an under-shepherd. I have to have the same heart. And there's never a time that you're going through something that Jesus isn't touched by your infirmity. Never a time. We sometimes, I, every now and then I'll hear somebody say, I've been praying, but God's not listening. Oh, God's listening. 
if out of the two of you, somebody's not listening, it's you, not God. The 21st verse, then the leading priest objected and said to Pilate, change it from the king of the Jews uh, to he said I'm the king of the Jews. And Pilate replied, no, what I've written, I've written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among the four of them. They also took his robe, but it was seamless, woven in one piece from the top to the bottom. All that verse reveals to us is not, is not just the, the, uh, the fact that it happened, but the fact it was only four soldiers that actually had the job of crucifying Christ. Four of them. So they said, rather than tearing it apart, let's throw dice for it. This fulfilled the scripture that says, they divided my garments among themselves and threw dice for my clothing. So that's what they did. Standing near the cross where Jesus, was Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, dear woman, here's your son. John's the only one that records in a gospel this, this part of this conversation. Even in the face of my Lord's suffering, the terrible suffering that he went through, he thought of his mother and he honored her. By making sure that she would always be taken care of after his departure. And he said to this disciple, here's your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill scripture, he said, I'm thirsty. There are little differences between the gospel writers' accounts of this. And I, I want to explain to you why. Because I really kind of get tired of people saying, well, you know, there's contradictions in the Bible. No, you have four gospel accounts each of them are writing what they remember, and that's what they do. So you have to look at all of them. Amen? S say, I need the whole word. So the differences can be explained is that no one writer recorded all that Jesus did. Matter of fact, if you'll remember, they said, had they recorded all the miracles that he did, you couldn't contain it in the book. So, so they each recorded a part. First, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Next, he admonished John to take care of his mother. He cries out to the father, and now he talks about his mother. Behold your mother. Behold your son. And after this, Jesus said he was thirsty and in response, someone dipped a sponge in vinegar and gave it to him. And others were standing there, were told the one giving him the drink to leave him alone and see if Elijah would come and save him. They mocked him right to the very end. Then he cried again with a loud voice saying, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then he said, it is finished. Or what did we discuss that that word was? Telelestai. Paid in full. It's finished. I'm done. A jar of sour wine was sitting there. They soaked a sponge it, put a hyssop branch, held it to his lips. Jesus tasted it. He said, it's finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now listen, when Jesus cried, it is finished, he was referring, he was not referring to the whole salvation plan. How do we know that? Because he still had to descend into the lower parts of the earth and lead the captives out. He still had to come back from the dead and ascend to the Father to make intercession for us. So Paul made it clear in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, that if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then our faith is in vain. We'd be yet in our sins. So Jesus must have been referring to his ministry here on earth and the old covenant law. Say this, the old covenant law was fulfilled by Jesus. Now I'm going to tell you a discussion I got in earlier, and it was a good discussion, a question I had uh, during breakfast, that there are things inside the law, and you've heard me say we're not under the law. I mean we're not under the law. We're under grace. The Bible is very clear that if we're under the law, then we can't be under grace, so we have to be under one of them, and we're under grace. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean if the Bible says that I shouldn't lie, that now that I'm under grace, it's okay to lie? No. 
because the, uh, uh, the Bible is very clear. It says grace teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Grace doesn't teach you to do whatever you want when you want to do it. Grace teaches us to live for God. Amen? So we really are without excuse. Turn to your neighbor and say, you ain't got no excuse. Straighten up. It was the day of preparation, and the Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies hanging there the next day, which was the Sabbath, a very special Sabbath, because it was Passover week. So they asked Pilate to hasten their death by ordering that their legs be broken. Then their bodies could be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus. When they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water flowed out. This report is from an eyewitness given an accurate account. He speaks the truth so that you also may continue to believe. These things happen in fulfillment of the scriptures that say not one of his bones will be broken. You know, the breaking of the legs of the condemned meant that they could no longer, this, I explained it earlier, while hanging on that cross, when they broke the legs, they could no longer push themselves up so that they could breathe, and so it would hasten their death. That's why they would break the legs. But Jesus was already dead. He'd already given up his spirit. So they didn't break his legs. But that was prophesied that they'd never break his legs. And they will look on the one they pierced. Uh, to make sure that Jesus was dead, they thrust a pier through his side and into the pericardium, the sac that goes around the heart, explaining why water came out of his side. Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus, because he, by the way, don't be a secret disciple of Jesus, <laughs> because he feared the Jewish leaders asked Pilate for permission, permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. He brought about 75 pounds. Actually, King James says 100 pounds. He brought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Following Jewish burial custom, where did Jews learn the burial custom? They learned it in Egypt when they were in Egypt. In Egypt, they learned how to mummify. And so whenever somebody would die, part of the process was to cover it with spices to preserve the body. And even on the hands, they'd wrap each finger separately and then, wipe, then, then, then tie, uh, wrap all the hands together and go over the whole body and make sure to, to preserve the body. Anybody went to go see a mummy ever in a museum? It didn't work. Because you start out as dust and you end up dust, you know what I'm saying? I remember one time I was with a, a family that had just lost a loved one. And, uh, and they wanted me to go with them to the funeral home while they were picking caskets and stuff. I don't really normally do that. And so they were nervous about it. I went with them. And so they were there, and I'm listening to this salesman. And the salesman says, this one is the one with the best seal on it to keep anything from getting inside. And so the family looked at me. Do you think that's important? I said, I don't know why it would be. Who cares if something is? It's a body. It's going to go to nothing anyway. If it's sealed up where it can't, no, nothing can get to it, it'll probably turn to soup before it turns to dust. <laughs> so who really cares about it? I don't really care what happens to this body after I'm dead. We had a, we had a uh, man who, uh, uh, his dad said, I'll pay for your funeral service, but he said, but not if you're going to get cremated because if you get cremated you can't go in the resurrection so I'm talking to this old man I said well what about everybody that ever died in a fire are they now excluded from resurrection because they died in a fire I said I think God knows the DNA of everybody so I think no matter what it come resurrection he, he, 
He'll know. And when I receive my new body, I'm going to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, buddy. I'll be the old one. <laughs> yeah, old or new, yeah. We'll be in heaven, guys, flexing our muscles. No, I know something about heaven, though. I know I got a mansion there with a large garage full of Harleys that don't leak. The place of crucifixion was near a garden where there was a new tomb, never used before. So, because it was a day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. They had to hurry because the Passover was coming. But they didn't finish the, uh, the embalming or whatever, the preserving of that body. We know that because when the women came to the tomb, they brought spices and stuff to finish the, the job. Of course, when they got there, they found uh, the, all those wrappings. Didn't have a body in it. Amen. You know, I love, I, love the, I love the Word of God, and I love the fact that here we teach wor verse by verse through it because it's important to see the story. One of the things important in this story, as I said earlier, is to look at Pilate. He's a large part of this story. Jesus knew exactly what he was there for and why he was going. He kept his dignity through the whole thing. No matter how they beat him, he's the Son of God. And he knew why he came, he knew why he was there, and he was going to fulfill the task that the Father had given him. Amen? And uh, if we look in Romans, I mean, uh, uh, in Hebrews 12, 2, I think it is, 12, 1 and 2, I think it's 12, 2, he says that the reason that he could endure the shame and go through all the... Because he saw the glory that was waiting for him. And I think part of the glory that was waiting for him was knowing that you would be there. Because he looked down through time and he thought, there's coming a day when this sacrifice that I'm making today is going to bring millions into the kingdom of God. Oh my goodness. And only he will get the glory for that. Amen? I love it. But Pilate is part of this story. Pilate had a decision to make whether or not he was going to choose God's way or uh, lean to pressures outside of God or to his own flesh and try to be a man pleaser instead of a God pleaser. And there would be Christians today say, I'd have never made that decision. But I'm here to tell you, you make decisions like that all the time. Every day, at some point, you're left with a decision, am I going to please God, or am I going to do what I, my flesh wants to do? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Am I going to follow along with God's plan for my life, or am I going to do what I want to do? Which one is it? And so we have to make decisions. And when we're left with those choices, we need to know those, those are important choices. I'm amazed at all the times when people say, I made a choice because God told me to. I'm going to tell you something. I'll bet nine times out of ten, the people that tell me things that God told them to do, I'll bet nine times out of ten, God never told them to do it. They wanted to do it, and it was their choice, and they have the attitude that they're going to do whatever they want to do. How many people know that's not a healthy attitude to have in the kingdom of God? I want to do what God wants me to do. Sometimes that's comfortable, and sometimes it's not very comfortable. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's a real sacrifice. But I have to decide whose side am I on. My own or God's side. Amen? If you came here this morning and you'd say, you know what? I'm not even sure that I'm saved. I'm not really sure about that. We act like that's a real complicated thing. And, and I apologize for religion everywhere that's taken such a simple concept on our part and made it difficult. I remember years ago we passed out index cards and I said, answer this question. Somebody has asked you, how can I make sure I'm going to go to heaven? And you should have seen the answers. They came back and I'd read them. Accept Jesus and live a holy life. So I'd tear it up and throw it away there. 
No. Your holy life, you suck at that. It's just Jesus. Amen. One after another, I went to the court. Does he want us to live a holy life? Yes. But if you're living a holy life is the, re is the requirement for heaven, none of you are going. Jesus lived a holy life. He took our sin and gave us his righteousness. Now, our heart should be to live a holy life. But when I go through those cards, it was always Jesus plus something else until they finally started getting the point, it's just Jesus. We need to trust in the finished work of the cross. Amen? Trust in what Jesus did. I had a, I had a uh, phone call this week. They said, what about the Sabbath? I said, what do you mean, what about the Sabbath? Aren't we supposed to be having church on the Sabbath? I said, of course not. Well, the, the, the Sabbath was an was a everlasting covenant. I said, you need to read your scriptures. And I shared them with a bunch of scriptures about it, that Jesus is our Sabbath. He's our Sabbath rest. We rest from our works and trust in his work. Amen? How do people get so mixed up? They don't look at the whole counsel of God. They look at part of it. Salvation is easy. Jesus did the hard part. You need to say yes to him today. Turn away from the old life and turn to Jesus. Amen? And if you're a Christian here today, you need to quit trying to make up your own mind about how to live your life and do what God tells you to do. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. In a minute, we're going to have a baby dedication because we love babies and they're the superstars. Hallelujah. I did, today, I just want you, I don't want you to come forward right here. I just want you to, to raise your hands and repeat this prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to pay for all of my sin. I turn away from my sinful life and I trust in Jesus today. Thank you, Jesus, for paying for all my sin. Now I ask, dear Lord, that you live through me. May my life honor you in all that I do. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated. We're going to have a baby dedication. I also want to tell you, I'll be preaching in, this, in the little church tonight at 630. Uh, I'm going to, I haven't done it for a few weeks now, but the, uh, I'll be right back on uh, mastering your money.